Hello, Mission. Hello, hello. All right, we are in a series. It's the second part of the series called What Would You Say? And the whole point behind What Would You Say is this. We have people that are around us. In fact, maybe it's even you. You might be someone here that's not totally convinced on Jesus yet, but you're here, you're curious, you want to investigate those things, and we love that. We believe that the world has got good questions about faith, but we also realize that we choke more often than we care to admit it, not because we don't believe, not because our faith isn't strong, not because we're necessarily we're immature Christians. It's just like sometimes when you're like put on the spot, you don't know what you would say. And so what we wanted to do was take six of the most imperative questions that people generally get asked about faith and tackle them. And the whole goal was that we have one question with a simplified answer, one Bible verse that, that you could actually memorize to, to source your truth. So you're not just saying, oh yeah, I just believe this because my parents raised me this way or I tried it and it worked for me. But you have like a source that's outside of yourself. And then also like hook you up with resources so that you can actually explore that and get to know it more or get, study it to the, as much as you want. Um, this week, the, the question that we're exploring is who is God? And we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. And if that sounds like that's a loaded question or a very difficult question, it is. It's super complicated. Um, it's so, it's incredibly massive. And so like it, this week, I'm just pumped that we're all here uh, because we're going to get a chance to go through it. But we're going through it from Acts 17. And if you could turn, go to your phone or go to your Bible and open up to Acts 17, you're going to want to check this out. And here's why. Paul is someone who shows up in the book of Acts and he didn't show up before that. See, before that, you have Luke who wrote the gospel of Luke. It, it kind of gives the, the chronological accounting of Jesus's life and ministry. But then he wrote a sequel. Luke wrote a sequel and the sequel is the book of Acts. And it's a chronicle, like play by play of the launch of the church. And this was one, like sometimes sequels stink. This one doesn't stink. It's awesome. But in the midst of it, you see Paul. And Paul surfaces as a guy who's not a fan of Jesus and he can't stand Christians. Maybe you can relate. He's someone who, he's like someone who like, I don't like Jesus. I don't like Christians. They're not just annoying. I think they're dangerous to the point that I want to see them either imprisoned or exterminated. Like he's on that level of animosity towards Christianity. And then he meets Jesus and all of his plans get flushed. It's like his five-year plan is screwed up. It's everything's messed up because his whole plan was to eradicate Christianity. And now he finds himself to be one of them. And so not only that, he's someone who's super obsessed with this idea of Jesus to the point that he can't go anywhere without talking about it. Do you have people like that? Did you know, like that when they get fixed on something, they just obsess? Do you have friends that they watch a movie and they just can't stop talking about it? You've got to see it. It's just amazing. You've got to see it. It's just phenomenal. A new restaurant shows up, like, oh, you've got to go there. You've got to go there. Okay, I'll go. No, 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 you've got to go there. Okay, dude, take it down a notch. Peloton, have you heard about Peloton? Have you tried it? It's amazing. It's amazing. Have you tried it? No, I want to try it less because you're so weird about it. That's Paul with Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he can't stop because he was so against Jesus for so long that once he discovered who Jesus actually is, he was like, I got to share this. And so everywhere he goes, he's obsessively talking about Jesus. And that's not safe. He's hanging out with Christians that now he's getting in trouble because he's a blabbermouth. And they were like, dude, keep this on the D. I mean, you don't have to be so open about this. He's like, no, no, no. I got to be open about this. Christians used to fear Paul because he was dangerous to them, because he was someone who was hunting them. Now they're fearing Paul, not because he's dangerous to them, because he's hunting them. He's just dangerous because he's just a blabbermouth. And, he's, and friends of Paul's are consistently getting in prison just because they were connected to him when he walks in the marketplace. Hey, I want to tell you guys about Jesus. I'm like, oh, Paul. And so the beginning of Acts 17, you've got Paul getting in trouble in Thessalonica. He's talking about Jesus there, starts a riot. Things, people are getting up, upset, frustrated. Things are just going bananas. People are saying, this guy's being way too political. He's like, he's talking about, you know, because we all know that Caesar is Lord and that Caesar is king. And he says, no, 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 Caesar isn't. Jesus is Lord and Jesus is king. And so because of that, we, we, we can't, pop, you know, and so people are like, they're getting in trouble. And so they had to bounce. They had to like take off out of Thessalonica. They go to Berea. And Berea was another place. Does Paul keep quiet there? No, he keeps blabbermouthing there and gets in trouble there. Like, and some people are, are initially going, this is amazing. Like, listen, what you're saying is huge, but we're Jewish people and we believe in the Bible and you're saying stuff about Jesus that sounds crazy. So we're going to check it. We're going to fact check you. And they fact check him and they're like, this is amazing. But there's guys on the outside like, wait a minute. This is the dude from Thessalonica that started that riot, the political guy. And then they start freaking out about, out about him. And so they had to bounce out of Berea. 
which stumbles them into Athens. Now, if you're Paul and Paul's homies, and you got in trouble for being a blabbermouth in Thessalonica to the point you had to leave, and you got in trouble in Berea because you were a blabbermouth to the point that you were either going to get killed or in prison and had to leave, what would you do when you get to Athens? Exactly. You do the exact same thing over again, just expecting a different outcome. And that's Paul. He just like, he's in the marketplace, not even like a private coffee at the local Athenian Starbucks or something. He's like out in the marketplace, just talking to people. And, and all of a sudden, the cool thing about Athens is they weren't, they were way more open-minded than these other places. They're way more tolerant. And they're like, okay, so here's the thing. You seem to be like talking about foreign gods that we're totally unfamiliar with but we've got a place where people nerd out about that big time. It's called, the, it's called Mars Hill, the, uh, the Areopagus, Areopagus. And it's a place where they have this discussion. In fact, we've got statues to all the gods that we know about. We even have like, like this place where it's like a statue to the unknown God because we want to hedge our bets. And if we missed one, we got at least the ambiguous agnostic God was right here. You know, it's like, we got all of that there. And, and so your stuff would be great there. I mean, they would eat this up because these guys love philosophy. They love talking about this. And Paul's like, bring it on. And so Paul then has a discussion that we're going to read right now. If you could stand for the reading of God's word. And again, we're going to be in Acts chapter 17. We're actually going to go a little bit before this. We're going to go to verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting at the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but he now commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Okay, I... I'm a huge Acts 17 fan because what we have Paul doing is saying this, you know what? I want to talk to you about how religion is man-made. That, that all of this, like the way that humanity, see, we seem to be hungering for an answer. And so we jump to conclusions and we, we formulate something that we can carve out, we can worship it. But I'm going to be, I want to just want to communicate to you about the fact that there is a one true God. In fact, this unknown God inscription you have, I'm going to tell you who that is thing I love about that is Paul's doing exactly what I hope all of us at mission do. He's not burying his head in the sand. He's not someone that's like, okay, you know what? The best thing we could do is get a bunch of people inside of a church building and like almost have like this safety net from the the evil world out there. And and just, we don't want to engage culture. We don't want to engage sinners. We want to stay inside where it's safe and insulated and incubated. And that's not the gospel. That's not what we see in scripture. Instead, he takes the good news to where it's needed most. He engages cultures. He talks to people respectfully. He engages their art. If you were looking at your own Bible when I was reading, you saw sections there where it had quotes, things that he said, blah, 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 and then it gave a quote. He's not quoting the Old Testament there. He's quoting pagan lyrics. He knows their songs. He's going into Athens, knowing their music, knowing their poetry, and he's spitting it back to them and saying, listen, your poets have said this, but let me just go ahead and share with you about how that's pointing to the one true God, how this is pointing actually to Jesus. And, I, and, and so he's doing this in such an amazing, phenomenal way. And so what he's doing is he's aiming to answer that very question, who is God? Now, again, what we talked about is we want to give you a question. We want to give you a simplified answer each week to these pertinent questions. 
a, per, a source where you can know that, that that answer is sourced not just from me, but it's sourced in God's word, and then some resources that you can kind of take it from there. Last week, we had the question, is the Bible man-made? And we wanted to give you a consolidated answer, and this was the best we could do. Three lines. And I said, I would love for everyone to memorize this, and I'm confident all of you did. So well done, folks. No, some of you did, but not all of you did. But if you didn't, I want to encourage you to jump in on that. In fact, one of the cool things is no one could memorize it in, in the, the setting here. And so we put that QR code up there. That QR code is going to be in every sermon that we do in this series so that you can go back and unlock each one of those six questions week by week. We only have two unlocked because we're only in the second week. What each one of those is going to have that layout of the question, the answer, the source, and resources for you to be able to figure that out. So again, we, we said that this would be a great way to answer the question, is the Bible man-made or not? With this answer, we wanted you to memorize it or personalize it, internalize it for yourself. We set you up with that so that we give you an even heavier thing to memorize this week. In answer to the question, who is God? Here's the thing we want you to memorize. There you go, boom, he is life. All right, so that's it. So if, if someone said, who is God? Your answer is, who is God? Okay, that, that's like, okay, that's an oversimplification. 100%. It totally is an oversimplification. Pastor Eric and I, we like worked hours to try to consolidate all of the information about God into one like just robust Costco level sentence that had lots in it, even though it was one sentence or maybe two. And we were failing every time we tried. We're like, okay, how do we get the eternality of God and the holiness of God and the salvific reality of what happened through salvation and the sovereignty of God and, and yet the, the, the compassion of God? How do we get that all into one sentence? And we were just messing up right and left. And then eventually we consolidated down to like, what if, what if we have one like I-beam load-bearing answer? One sentence that's brief and portable that everyone could memorize and then we're able to hang on it, those other truths. And we can just consolidate those down to four. And so in the answer to the question, who is God? He is life. And this is what we mean. He is the creator of life. He brings meaning to life. He offers eternal life. And more personally, because of those three realities, he's the leader of my life. So let's unpack that. First off, the creator. He is the creator of life. Who is God? He is life. He is the origin of life. One of the amazing things that we have today is, is the ability to be so scientist, scientifically robust that we have more and more information. And the thing that's impressive to me about scientists is that there's more and more scientists. The deeper we go, the more we find out, the more we understand, there's more and more scientists that are saying, like one MIT professor, listen, I was an atheist. And the more research I did, I became an agnostic. And the more research I did, the more I became a theist. And the more research I did, I became a Christian. Because the deeper you go into the origin of everything, the more you realize this is not circumstance, chance, luck. It's so much more bizarre to that. And on top of that, if we're, one, one MIT professor, she said, put it this way. She said, there's a difference between being a scientist and scientism. Scientist is someone that says, whether you're a Hindu, an atheist, a Buddhist, or a Christian, you should be going to finding facts. You're not imposing, you're not vomiting on your information, some bias or agenda. You're just trying to see wherever this evidence goes. That's good science. Scientism says that science is the only way to find truth. The only way to find truth is through science, the scientific method. And nobody thinks that. And the more the deeper we get into science, scientists are shedding that more and more. Because because she said, I realize that science is one of the tools we have to find truth, but there's also history. You don't investigate history the same way you investigate science. They're two different disciplines. And yet we're able to come to truth through finding things within history. There's also philosophy. Now, if you have just philosophy or you have just history or you have just science, you are trying to come to truth handicapped of all the other tools. You should be able to utilize all the tools that you have. And what she, her perspective was, as someone who's not into scientism, but as a scientist, I was someone who was able to realize my science helps me understand origins of this universe, that my faith is, helps understand the undergirdings of that. I understand the what, and now I understand the why. And one of the things that's so impressive about that is that, um, again, if you're devoid of that, if all you have is what I can test through the scientific method, then you, draw, you come to this conclusion— Within the origin of the universe, nothing produces everything. Non-life produces life. 
Randomness produces fine tuning. Chaos produces information. Unconsciousness produces consciousness. And non-reason produces reason. And non-Christian scientists more and more are coming to the conclusion that's illogical. That's not tenable. That's not reality. What is reality is what we're finding within science. We're finding three things that are just blow my mind. Fine tuning the mechanisms of, of, of the human body and other biological life and DNA. The fine tuning of the universe. We talked about this uh, a while back during a series called It's Complicated, where we asked the question, is faith and science at odds with each other? And the answer is no. They are not at odds with each other. Um, and and it, that's becoming more and more apparent. But the amazing thing with fine tuning is the more we're understanding the universe that we belong to, that we're in, the more blown away scientists are that, we sh- that we're even here. This is so just bonkers. I'm just gonna go, there's uh, the fine tuning argument is basically this. There are, it's almost like a dial, like a dial between one and 100 and you have to have it right on the right number. But except for that, the right number is like not just one to 100, but it's like, like a million. And you have to get on the exact one of that in order for life to exist. A couple of those dials are as follows. Gravitational force, electromagnetic force constant, strong nuclear force constant, weak nuclear force constant, and the cosmological constant. And each one of these is like, this is one of like hundreds of dials that are just perfectly tuned that if we didn't have this, there'd be no life. I'm going to read you that last one, um, cosmological constant, because it just stokes me up. It says this, it, it refers to uh, the control of the expansion and speed of the universe. So in other words, there's the Big Bang and there's an explosion out into the universe, right? And so there's like the speed of that, the heat of that, everything is very, very telling. It refers to the balance of the attractive force of gravity with a hypothesized repulsive force of space observable only at very large size scales. It must be very close to zero. That is, these two forces must be nearly perfectly balanced. To get it at the right balance, the cosmological constant must be fine-tuned to something like one part in 10 to the 120th power. If it was just slightly more positive, the universe would fly apart. Slightly more negative, and the universe would collapse. This is what leads scientists who are not Christians to say things like what the scientist Stephen Hawking said, and he was an atheist to the day he died, but he said this, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been finally adjusted to make possible the development of life. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these dials that if the universe was slightly more this gravitationally, if the, the charge of an electron was slightly off, nothing would happen. Now this is bananas because a lot of scientists say, well, that's kind of arrogant though, because we're not finding life anywhere and it's only here on earth. And the likelihood that all this universe happens just for life on this earth is like, it's just crazy. And so there, there, we realize the improbability of this. And so there's a couple of answers that we have. One is a multiverse. A multiverse says that as expansive as the universe is now that we understand it is so unlikely that this was just an accident, that all, the, all those dials were perfect, that we have life, that it must be that there must be gazillions of universes simultaneously, and we just happen to be the lucky one. That takes a lot of faith to believe that because there's no evidence for it. Another leading observation is there must be some intelligent alien life form outside of our universe that orchestrated this universe just so to develop life on this planet as we see it now. So it's either a multiverse or aliens. That's the leading perspective. And here's the thing. As Christians, we agree that there was an outside intelligent force that did this, that there was an outside intelligent person that pulled this off. You guys heard of SETI? SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They've got dishes that are, are aimed all around the universe because they're hoping to find something, because they're hoping to hear something. If they hear just like a, or they see like lights, they're going to lose their mind. It's going to be awesome. People are like, it's true. Independence Day actually is happening. Like, people are going to flip out. It's going to be huge. Like, all they're looking for is that. All they need is, because if they hear that, if they see a, a pattern, what does that tell them? There's someone behind the pattern because patterns don't happen like that without an intelligent origin, without someone doing that. To which I say, 
The fine tuning of the universe informs us that we see that. If you look within the mechanism of the body, if you're agnostic, I want to encourage you to get more scientific. Start studying the cell, start studying bacteria. And all of a sudden you start to see like the fact that organisms have rotors and shafts and like, and, and motors to be able to manufacture things within our body. Like the more we're able to see into the microscopic, the more blown away we are with the design behind it, the machines behind it. This isn't rando. This is realistic. Fine-tuning the mechanisms of human life and biology and DNA. DNA is one of those things where the more that we've gotten to know DNA, the inexplicable reality of, of how this all came to be without an intelligent source because DNA is a code. It's code. It's written code. It's, it's a language. This is what led um, an, an individual who was an atheist by the name of Dr. Francis Collins. He was an atheist. And then as he got deeper and deeper into science and he started studying DNA, he started to realize there is no way that this is just random mutations and time. This is a code that is written into, that is more than just your eye color and, and your height and your skin tone. It's more than that. It's a written code within you that actually replicates and fixes itself. It's phenomenal. That's what led him to go from being an atheist to a believer in DNA. So I would say if SETI is out there looking for a beep, 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 to go <gasps> life, I would say, an intelligent source, I would say absolutely. And that's what we see in scripture. Scripture says that, that the, the heavens, the skies proclaim the work of your hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they give us knowledge. Why? Because God wants us to know there's a source. And this is what Paul says when he was talking on that hill in Athens. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone what? Life. Who is God. He is life, and he is the one who created life. If you hear, here, you should feel so privileged. We are on a privileged planet. We have a privileged time frame. Everything was perfectly tuned so that life would happen, and you are a living, breathing, walking, talking example of the fact that happened. He creates life. Not only does he just create life and walk away and go to Cancun, he creates life, and then he gives life meaning. He brings meaning to life. In fact, that's what Paul says um, right there. Uh, next slide. Um, he says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. There's a sovereignty about God. Like he's like doing something within this human experiment that, that is on purpose and for purpose. Not only did he create everything, but he gives us meaning. And Jesus tells us what that meaning is. If you ever want to know the meaning of your life, Jesus tells us what it is. And he says it in Matthew. He puts it this way. We put that up there. There we go. Love God and love others. Jesus is like, here's the deal. I want you to go ahead and I want you to think about everything that you've seen in the Old Testament, everything your grandma told you, everything you learned in the TED Talk. You want to summarize everything that is the truest true about the meaning of life. It, you can summarize it in two realities, two commands. Love God and love the people around you. Love God and love others. So if you're like, like 18 years old, you're a senior in high school. You're going to walk in graduation today and you're like, I still don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what you're going to do either. I can't help you on that. But I can tell you this, whatever you do, if you're a follower of Jesus, the meaning of your life is found in loving God and loving others. You could do that as a plumber, as a pastor, as a paramedic, as other things that start with P. You could do that. Love God and love others. Like if you're someone that's leaning into the meaning of life, it's loving God and loving others. Why? Because God is love. The first John says it. John's like, we should love one another because love comes from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you don't have love, you don't know God because God is love. That's the first time in human history someone wrote that statement. If you run into anyone today that say, I'm spiritual but not religious, I believe that God is love. They've commandeered that reality from 1 John 4 that says God is love because no one said that before that because that's the reality of the true God. Now, if I'm talking to my friend, Jimmy, who's, who's a Jehovah's Witness, he believes in God, but he's like, I don't believe that Jesus is God. Jesus kind of was created by the Father. And I don't believe the Holy Spirit is God because he's just kind of, that's just like a force. It's a, it's a it, not a, it, not a he. And I would say to Jimmy, actually, no, I, if, if you're asking me who God is, I'd say he's life. 
He's a creator of life and he gives us meaning to life. And Jimmy would say, I agree. I would say, well, here's the thing. If God is love, because 1 John says that, and we both agree that God is love from 1 John, before God created anything and anyone, before Jesus was created or the angels were created or anything was created and God is love, who is God loving? Before God created anyone to love, who did he love if God is love? And Jimmy would have to say, I don't know. But I would say, I could tell you. Because the Bible presents that God had his three in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Before anything was created in creation, you have Jesus who was not created, the Holy Spirit who was not created, the Father, God the Father who was not created. Perfectly from eternity past, before anyone was created, in a perfect relationship of love. God the Father loving the Son, loving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit loving the Father, etc. Perfect love. So that creation wasn't created so that God would, like, I just need, I'm just so bored. I need someone to love me. I need someone to worship me. So I just got to create people so I can get that from them. That's manipulation. That's abuse. We don't see that in God. Instead, we see God who needed nothing in perfect relationship, perfect love, creating humanity not to get love, but to give love. He's the one who created life. He's the one who brings meaning to life. But then as a Christian, all of a sudden, I also realize that I could be honest that, man, I mess up all the time. I bring so much toxicity into this world and brokenness and my selfishness and the words that I say to people and the messed up things I think. Like that's a thing that happens. And I realize that I'm disconnected from this creator God who gives me meaning. I break the meaning that he gives me and I break the purpose of my creation all the time. And that's made a distance between me and him. And he could have left it like that, but he chose not to. Instead, what did he do? He offers eternal life. He's a creator of life. He gives meaning to life and he offers eternal life. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though, and I love this line, though he is not far from any one of us. God did not have to make a way to us, but he did. He did make a way to us. And, and John, John 3, 16 puts it, for God so loved the world. Okay, so we're not only created in love, we're not only given meaning of life in love, but we're rescued in love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God is life and he wants that for his creation. He wants that for you. If you're somebody who's disconnected from him, if you're someone that said, look, I, I, I realize that there might be a God. I realize that, there, that he might have established meaning. But this is the part that I'm fuzzy on. I wanted to share with you. It's not complicated. It's recognizing that this God who did all those things loves you enough to make a way for you to have a restored relationship. And that was through Jesus. There's no magic Harry Potter formula that you got to like re- recite just right in order. Boo! All of a sudden it happens. Instead, it's just a recognition. He did that. He loves me and I can receive it or reject it, but he offers me eternal life. And that's not saying if I pray this prayer, one day I'm going to go to heaven. Woohoo! Instead, it's saying this. If I turn to him and I ask him to forgive my sins from that very second, something starts inside of me that will never stop. Something is connected between me and God that will never fade, expire, or get revoked because of my stupidity. Not once. Instead, what I'm going to have is an eternal bond between me and God. That means that I'm going from that moment to every year and decade that I've got left on this planet, walking with him, being led by him. And one day, I'm going to die. And every, that's one thing everyone in this room has in common. One day we're going to die, and we don't know when that is. Some of us are going to be shocked by it. Some of us, we're going to see it coming because we're going to start to decline. But all of us, we're all going to hit that wall. If you're in Christ, though, you're going to hit that wall and keep going. And what you keep going into is life the way that it was always intended to be. That's what Scripture says. Why? Because God is life. He is the creator of it. He gives it meaning, and he gives you eternal life. Have you received that? Are you experiencing that? That reality. The most personal part of this whole thing is the final bit, that he's the leader of my life. I can academically believe the first three things, 
In fact, maybe a lot of you have. It's a very religious thing to do. I believe the right things. I believe that God created the world. I believe that he gives meaning in life. I believe that he died on the cross and rose from the grave. Is he the leader though of your life? Is he leading your life? Or are you leading your life? As humans, we make decisions based off of things that make sense to us in the moment, okay? I'm hungry. I'm gonna get me some Arby's. I'm thirsty. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink something. I'm lonely. I'm gonna find companionship. We operate out of our hungers and our thirst. That's very human. But what's also very human, unfortunately, is to idolize those hungers and thirsts, the things that, that drive us. Some of us are driven by our sex drive. Some of us are driven by our, our popularity drive, our feeling of, of contentment drive, or I, I feel most valuable if I have stuff drive. And so I'm going to keep on trying to like get bank for, for like, to, so I can get enough money so I can have enough stuff. So I'll feel good enough drive. Buddhism teaches that the best thing you could do is to realize that all those things are going to lead to suffering. So the best thing you could do is to suppress them. You have a sex drive, suppress it. Pretend like it doesn't exist. You, 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 want, you desire human interaction, suppress it. You, you love guacamole, suppress it. Oh. Whatever you enjoy should be questionable. Christianity doesn't teach that. Christianity doesn't teach to suppress your desires, but rather to order them by saying, I, me, my hungers are not the leader of my life. If they're the leader of my life, I'm going to make epic fail after epic fail after epic fail. I'm going to live a wake of destruction and pain and carnage in the people's lives behind me. If I'm just like reacting in the moment, I, by, this is what I feel like saying. This is what I feel like doing. This is feel like what I feel like going for. Instead, I say, I, I, as someone, I get to say, I don't trust me enough to make all those decisions as if I'm impeccable. And if you trust yourself, you're like, look, I, I just trust myself. I, I got to just listen to my heart. Have you like looked back on the last 10 years of your life? I know it's, it's terrible. It's sad. I feel the same way. Like think about like 10 years ago, some of the decisions you made. Cringeworthy. Have you watched yourself or listened to yourself on video like from like five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago? And you're like, have you seen some of the things you posted back then? You're like, why? Because in the moment, that made perfect sense to you to do that, say that, wear that. But all of a sudden you're like, maybe I wasn't perfectly on top of things when I made that decision. And that's humility. And so as, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, what I'm saying is this, I trust myself not to make the best decision in the moment because I'm consistently polluted and intoxicated by d- doing what my hunger and my thirst tell me to do. Instead, I want God to be the leader of my life. I want him to be the leader of my life so that when I'm looking at each one of those decisions, whether it's sex or it's, it's money or it's, it's in interaction with people, whatever, I want to say, I'm not called to suppress those. I'm called to order them under God's leadership in my life. His leadership in my life informs each of those decisions in the play-by-play. And I get to, and if someone's like, well, hold on a second though. What gives God the right to be the leader of your life? Why would you cede that autonomy to God? I said, I'll give three reasons for that. He's my creator. He gave me meaning and he died for me. If you did that for me, I'd follow you too. But you didn't, he did, so I follow him. When we wrap all this up, when we look at, at and we're just looking at it at a glance, you're gonna have that question, who is God? And your answer could simply be what? His life. And then remember as many of these as you can. We, on, the, on the resource page, we also included a couple of cross references. If we were to look at, the, at those, they're great. But I mean, I would just say he's life. I mean, he's the create, he made everything, he created my life. He gives my life meaning. He saved me from my worst version of myself and my sin. He's the leader of my life. Like I'm not a religious freak. I'm just someone who's wise enough to know that he knows more than I know. So I'm letting him lead each of the decisions in my life. And I question the ones that just make sense to me. On, on, the, on the source, I want to encourage you to memorize that verse. Ironically, that's one of those verses that's one of the pagan poem, poems that Paul just quotes, but yet he infuses it with the meaning from the Holy Spirit to source about God. That's such a great answer. 
you know, in, in God, I live, I move, and I have my being. Why is he life? Well, because in him, I have life. I my being, I move, I'm, I operate all because of him. Memorize that, Acts 17, 28 a, For in him, we live and move and have our being. I wanna encourage you to jump onto the resource page too and just nerd out on this. That guy I was talking to you about that, that he cataloged the human DNA and became a Christian. He gives this speech at Caltech. It's like an hour long, but feel free to nerd out on it. It's him talking about how, oh, I'm sorry, that's Francis Collins, sorry, the second one. The language of God, a scientist presents evidence for belief at Caltech. Um, Stephen Meyer, he's a Christian and he, uh, that fine tuning of the universe in 30 minutes on CNN, he gives an interview where he's talking about the fine tuning realities that lead us to understand who God is. We have a couple of videos on there that all, also are helpful. And we have a couple of books that we also recommend just for you to continue to look through that. And so you will go to the final uh, screen where you can look at that. Also the QR code, that's missionbible.church front slash WWYS is also a way to fast track there. Folks, I told you last week that I had to go to the eye doctor. I knew that I needed like, like the, the up close stuff was getting weird. And I was like texting people and hoping that autocorrect was not spitting out profanity because I couldn't see it. So I knew that was happening, but then I had another test and they told me what? Now oh, you remembered. Okay. All right. I'm colorblind. Somebody, want, uh, even someone at, the, at one of the services um, told someone and got back to me and said, oh, he's colorblind. That's why he always wears black. I can see color. And I don't always wear black. I mean, that's why I wore this awesome blue shirt. Now, when I was the second, the second test that I had, though, I had, I had the colorblind test, the second test. Like, I was freaked out. That shook me. And so I'm in my second test, and she said, okay, here, I'm going to give you something to press this button. And when you press this button, we, I want you to look at, through these, like, these binoculars, and I want you to watch for any squiggly line. And when you see a squiggly line, press the button. I'm like, I got this. I'm like, I got to redeem myself from that last test. And so I'm like looking through and it's just dark and I'm just like waiting. And I'm waiting. And now I'm sweating. And I'm just like going, should I just like press the button just to pretend like I see squigglies? I'm waiting for these neon squigglies. There's no squigglies. I've never wanted a squiggly more in my life. <laughs> just show me a squiggly. No squiggly. And then I just said, excuse me, I- have you started the test? And she said, yeah. Like, yeah, blind dude, I did. And I said, I can't see anything. She's like, oh, oh someone left the cap on. Yeah, Julie thought that was funny too, yeah. We live in a world that is hungry, hungry for God. So much so that they're creating other things that they could worship with their life, their success, their money, their power, their sex, so that they could throw their life in to give it meaning, to give it purpose and worth. And there is a block that they can't see that. The fact that you can means that you have the opportunity to share that. What I'd like us to do just in closing, we're gonna sing one final song, if you could stand. And as we're singing this final song, I would love for you to be praying about opportunities that you may have with the people in your world that are still like, I just, I can't see. The cap's still on. Someone's left the lid. I just don't see what's going on. And if I could have the the prayer team come up front. Um, Our prayer team every week, our prayer team, they come up front so they could pray with people. If you've got someone in your world that you would just love to start a conversation with, you're nervous about it, you've heard two weeks on, is the Bible man-made and who is God? And you kind of got to sense that, but you're still nervous. Coworker, friend, family member. If you'd like to just pray for that person, I would encourage you during this last song or even after the service, come forward, pray with our prayer team up front. But even outside of that, if you're going through life and there's just something that's difficult, life is hard. God is good. You need prayer. I want to encourage you to come forward and pray with the people up front. Let's go ahead and close the prayer right now. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for the fact that you are in fact someone who has revealed yourself through creation. You've made the on-ramp so wide for us to ask hard, good questions that lead us to find you. We thank you for revealing yourself in creation. We thank you for revealing yourself in your word. And God, I thank you for making us ambassadors that you want to reveal that truth to the people around us imperfectly, through stutter steps, through imperfect presentations. 
And yet you are powerful to work through even those. I pray for this week that those in this room are living that out in real time and that the results will be able to point back and say, you did it. I will give you thanks for that, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Let's sing.